Okay, so what we've just covered is just a, a glimpse of how unapply operates. How it operates in contrast to apply in a companion class, which takes the pieces to make up the case class and, and to make up the class itself and gives us an instance of that class, which has those pieces. Unapply takes the whole and it breaks it down into its pieces. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've seen that we get them automatically using case classes, that it automatically creates not just the class, but the companion object that has unapplied defined automatically. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see how these things can apply in, in match expressions. Okay? Okay, so match expressions in Scala have a syntax that's it's a little bit like, like switch. How many people in here have used the switch construct in C or C++ or Scala, or excuse me, or, or, or Java? Yeah, okay. So switch, switch does the job, but it's got some real issues with it. Often people omit breaks, break expressions, and the code falls through. It also is not very powerful. It can handle a lot of particular cases, but not ranges of cases in its traditional form. Um, you know, if, we can have ifs with if, and else, and else if, and else if, and else if, but it gets kind of, it's kind of awkward. Match is going to have some elements of this, but in a much more beautiful and general way. Much more, if I may. Slick way. Okay. Um, so the nice piece, one of the nice pieces of this is you can match elements of different types. But more than that, you can, at the time you're matching, you decompose the arguments into the pieces that you actually want to refer to. So you say, hey, if it matches a, you know, if it matches a, an array of two things, do this. If it's an array of three things, do this, where this refers to the particular values of the first, second, and third location or what. Okay, um, so this is going to be this is going to be a very uh, nice feature that comes automatically with case classes. So, in the most trivial form, this is this is just kind of relating it to something you know. This is its most impoverished, embarrassingly kind of uh, limited form. Expression match, and it's a bunch of cases. What does this look a lot like? Looks a lot like a switch statement, doesn't it? Case one, we do this. Case two, we do that. Substitute colon for these arrows, and you, you have something that looks pretty similar to a to a to a traditional switch statement. And then you have case underbar for the default case. Instead of saying default, you say that. And this looks just like a papering over, just kind of yet another form of switch, another syntax for writing switch. Not particularly interesting. But we're going to do something much nicer than that. OK, so here we are going to have, for example, a list coming in. And this list can either be nil, meaning it holds no values, in which case, here's the magnitude squared of the list. Here, if it's nil, we just return 0. On the other hand, if this list has a head and a tail, or incidentally the tail may be nil, we'll take the square of the head plus magnitude squared called on the tail. So here we have kind of a base case and an inductive case almost, right? We have the, the base case where it's nil, we'll return zero. If we have a case where we had followed by something, We'll just deal with the head, and then we'll delegate the same method to deal with the tail. So here, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking the list, and it's list match, and we're handling the different cases and seeing which of them apply. But not only that, ladies and gentlemen, when we're checking which applies, we're binding the arguments. So if this applies, if this list is not nil, but it instead has a head followed by a tail, we are simultaneously binding head to be the value at the head and tail to refer to the value of the tail. 
and then we can refer to them in our expression of what to do. So we're matching and binding values if that match succeeds. Does that make sense? It's a hard thing to get your hand around perhaps the first time. We'll look at a couple more instances of it. Here we go. Okay, we're going to match some expression. This is going to be an integer um, or a long expression. And here we're going to say, okay, if this is an even number, we will handle it in this way, where x is going to refer to the value associated with this, uh, that, that's even. If it's a prime number, we have n, which is prime, we can refer to n as the prime number. If it's squared, we can refer to n as a, as a square number, etc. So here, if it's an even number, we'll first handle that case. And we can refer to x over here as the even number. This is checking, is it prime, is it even? But it's also more than checking, it's binding to x. So if it is even, x means the even number. Prime is checking, is this number prime? If so, n is the prime number that we can refer to. Mm -hmm. Let's go a few more examples here. This is sweet. This is sweet. Okay, regular expressions in Scala are written like this. We have a string. In this case, it's a raw string. It has triple quotes around it. Meaning, don't, don't look inside it. Don't try to futz with the things inside it. These backslashes, don't try to interpret them. It's triple quotes. You could alternatively have just written raw. I think it's R-A-W and quotes around it. The point is, don't look inside it. So these backslashes, you don't have to worry. That's part of the regular expression. So what is this regular expression including? What, what is this regular expression describing? What strings does this regular expression describe? Two numbers. Two numbers. Good. Good. And what are these? Uh, what are these uh, uh, parentheses around each each of those sort of pairs of numbers? It's called a group, not in a ring theory sense or or number theory sense but in the sense of it remembers those. It knows those are, those are like significant subunit chunks of that. And it's actually going to remember it. This is going to be match submatch one, submatch two, submatch three. Okay? So if it matches this, it'll we can extract the first two numbers separate from the second two numbers, separate from the third. We can refer to each. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Regular expressions automatically allow us to extract, using unapply, those elements that we've matched. So the first of the elements, say, is day, and then month, and then year. In the US, they typically write month, day, year, for reasons that are somewhat strange. Um, it's kind of nice conceptually if it goes from most detailed to least detailed or if you have to have it the other way. But having month and then day and then year is a little bit strange by my books. But it's a strange system that we see a lot. Okay, but the point is, we could say case, pattern. So here we're matching a string. Hmm? We're matching a string. And if it matches this pattern, then day, month, and year are bound to the corresponding element. This is the pattern, and we're binding each of those to the corresponding elements of that pattern. Remember, a match statement consists not only of asking, does it match this case, but at the same time as it's matching the case, it's extracting the values that, that match it so that we can refer to them. Right? It's, it's, it's extracting head and tail so we can refer to them. If it matches this case, it's going gonna, it's gonna to extract them. If if this matches an even, this is going to, x is going to refer to the even number. If this matches, if this string matches this pattern, 
we're going to be able to refer to these two, the first group here as day, the second group as month, the third group as year. Does that make sense? Okay, so a little bit more regular expressions because they're great. We can create a regular expression here that consists of you know, regular expression pattern. I, I trust most people in the room have seen regular expression. I hope that most people in the room have realized the power of regular expression. They're extremely powerful constructs. They're not universal. I mean, there's a, there's a language hierarchy and regular expressions are strictly less powerful than context-free grammars, but, but they're extremely useful for describing patterns and strengths that, are, that, that have a, a clear delineation in what, they, uh, what can, they can denote, but it's a very important class of things that they can denote. Okay, so often we use raw strings because there's backslashes in here and stuff like that. Um, and using these things, we can, for example, ask find first in, find all in, which actually extract all the subcomponents of the string. By the way, find first in, guess what this returns? An option. Returns an option, ladies and gentlemen, because it might be none, couldn't find it. We can also do replace associated with strings, etc. Um, so here we might have something like this, ladies and gentlemen, and this gets this gets a little bit more difficult to reason about how it's doing this. It's awesome. It's awesome. So look, here's a regular expression. Um, uh, here's a regular expression for for um, for for date up here. Now, actually, yeah, so we could write, what does this mean? If we had a string, and, and suppose re date is, is, you know, a regular expression denoting a, a date, uh, this this sort of thing, um, with a four four digit year here. If we did this, don't, don't consider this part of the match here. Just ignore this later part for the moment. We had re date equals that. What's going on there? We, we saw that syntax a few minutes ago. What does that mean? Unapply. Yeah, it's unapplied. And so day, month, year are being extracted from string by the regular expression, right? This is just like a val where we're declaring like a val day, val month, val year being each subcomponent, each sub match uh, of the regular expression when applied to the string. But this just makes it much easier to write. We're extracting it at the same time here. We saw this earlier with tuples. We saw it earlier with being able to write a, you know, this this uh, uh, person C, uh, age, income, mother equals P3. Remember that? Okay. So we can do that, and that's that's slick by my book. But here we can take string. We can match. For example, regular expressions. All of these refer to the same regular expression. They happen to refer to. We get a different regular expression it's referred to. We could say, suppose it's written in U.S. style. Suppose it's written only with two, you know, two, two uh, digit year instead of four. We could have different regular expressions. In this case, they're all written this way. But we have some other twist to it. Here, ladies and gentlemen, we have explicit values here: 1999, 2000. So what does that mean? What is, what is this first one matching? All cases where what? It's 1999. We have a date, and the date occurs in 1999. This is all cases where it occurs in 2000. This is all cases where it occurs in any other year. This is occurring from top to bottom. Handle the 1999 case. If we reach this 2000 case, we know 1999 has already been handled. We handled 2000 case. And then down here, we know it's not 1999 or 2000. It would have been handled above. And so it's some other, some other year, okay? And we could do this even with specifying particular values here, because basically what it's doing is it's extracting day, month, and year, and saying, okay, is the year equal to the string? This day, month, and year, those are strings extracted from a string. And so it's extracting a day, month, and year, and saying, hey, is the year equal to this? Yes or no? And if so, if it is, you do this. 
Otherwise, we'll go up to that, to that next, okay? Now, um, we can also do this in a loop. Take, check this out. This is pretty, pretty neat. Um, in a loop, we can go through, we can find all the occurrences of a regular expression on a string, maybe in different lines, different, a single line we're extracting. For each of them, we can extract the day, month, and year, and then we could refer to the day, month, and year down here. Now that we've extracted it, we can refer to it, maybe print it out, maybe put it into a database, maybe you know, put it out into a file or what have you. But the point is, we've extracted it from the regular expression, and now we can just operate in terms of the day, month, and year of strings that we've extracted. For each match that was found in the string by the regular expression. Yes? Sorry, does this case with the string and then the yeah. match? Yeah. Is that going to match the first occurrence? Uh, yes, it will. In this case, it's going to match. So unapply, I think, by default, is going to match the first occurrence within that. That is correct, yeah. Um, if you need to deal with later occurrences, you might be dealing with something more like the below, yeah. Um, and I believe, although I could stand corrected, um, I may be off, but I believe that for each of these, it's actually re, reparsing, okay, you know, day, month. I don't, I don't think it's remembering, doing, doing the parse once and then remembering, okay, is year 99, is 2000. I think each time it's, it's re-extracted, but I could well be wrong about that. So that would have to be checked, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, pattern matching. Pattern matching can occur you know, based on types, it can occur based on structural properties, etc. A few more of these, just in the closing minutes here. We can match based on different types here. So if this is a string, if the expression is a string, then we do this. If it's a double, we do this. If it's a character, we do that. Um, uh, how's this? Okay, so this thing returns a pair of quotient to remainder. Um, if we have a quotient, but the remainder is zero, we know that the division went in exactly. It went in exactly a certain number of times. So there was no remainder, so we'll handle that case. If it went in zero times and there's a remainder, then we'll, we'll handle that. We know here the remainder is not zero, or it would have been handled that first time. Uh, in general, if, if we have a certain quotient or remainder, neither of which are zero, we'll handle that general case. Mm -hmm. Here, we have a pair, a tuple, and we're just, this is on apply, applied to the tuple. So here, we're finding quotient if, if the remainder is zero. Does that make sense? Okay, let's, let's uh, try a few more. Oh, here, here, uh, how fitting. How sweet and fitting it is. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we come back, we circle around at the end of the class to some of our topics in the beginning of the class. So here, here we have uh, an option of t, and we match that. And if, if this is a sum of v, in other words, if this holds some value v, then we can operate on v. Right? If, if, this is a, if this is an option that actually holds a value, we can then refer to over here um, the, that value v. To the right side. On the other hand, if it's a none, we'll handle that option, uh, that, that case where it, it doesn't actually hold the value. So this is how we might use an option to handle the different cases. And the key thing is we're extracting V here so we can refer to it. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, we'll probably, after the break, talk a little bit how this is. Check this out. Okay. So here's an array that's returned. If the array is empty, we'll do this. If the array consists of only a zero, hold that. If the array is a single element that's not zero, we'll handle that one. If the array has two zeros up front, we'll, we'll, well if, it's, if it's composed of only two zeros, if it has a zero and a non-zero value, we'll handle that. If otherwise, two arbitrary values. Otherwise, any number of different values in the array that are not matched by these, we'll handle that. Here, we're destructuring the array. Yeah. For that case, um, like the fifth one where it's zero and y, yeah. can it reach that case? 
Because we've got the one that's looking at the cert first one is zero in the second case. Uh, no, this is if there's a single element oh, okay. that's zero. Gotcha. It's actually, I, I, I misspoke when I said if it starts with zero. If it's a single element that's zero, if it's a single element that's by implication not zero, if it's two elements that are both zero, if it's two elements where the first is zero, the second by implication because it's occurring after this is not zero, here's two specific elements which which didn't match any of these. And this is something that starts as zero and then it's followed by anything else okay so it's that that would be for the start with zero and followed by any number of different things um another case this is from scholar for the impatient which is a is a great book destructuring a list okay um great uh so so we use case classes a lot with these sort of expressions to destructure things and handle them um time is up um these types of learning will be very helpful in the future. Um, and uh, I will try to make sure I could share my uh, transcript. One regret is last time's transcripts. I made the mistake of I started up the Scala shell for last class as, uh, as root. No, no, as root. Uh, I was root. I was pseudo. I had pseudoed over and, and I was doing something. And then I started the Scala shell. So I actually didn't get a transcript of last time. If anyone has a transcript from last class who wants to send it to me, I'll annotate it and post it to the site as well. Annotate it with comments as I normally want. But I'll try to do that for today's for sure. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, have a wonderful uh, break. And I'll look forward to seeing you uh, after the break. <laughs>